With coronavirus spiking around the world amid easing lockdowns, all the more need for that coronavirus vaccine. In the global scientific rush, Russia is the latest, saying its vaccine will soon be approved, although no testing data has been released amid concerns about cutting corners. Right now, there are more than 165 vaccines in development and 27 are in human trials. Carl Zimmer is an award-winning science writer with a weekly column in the New York Times. Here he is breaking down the biology with our Walter Isaacson. Thanks, Christian. And Carl Zimmer, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's been an amazing past seven days or so for vaccines, which is what we hope will all save us soon. And with your vaccine tracker in the New York Times, you've done a wonderful job tracking them. Why don't we start with the one that I think may be furthest along, which is the Oxford vaccine. Uh, explain to us where that is in phase three trials and how that actually works. It's a traditional vaccine. So the Oxford University uh, has a vaccine uh, which they are testing out with AstraZeneca, the drug maker. Uh, and basically what it is, is it's a, it's, a, it's a virus that delivers a gene into your cells. So this particular kind of virus is only infects chimpanzees. Uh, and so the thinking is that people have not been exposed to this before, so it'll be uh, effective for getting into cells. It can't replicate though. The, these, these kinds of uh, viral vectors are actually engineered, so all they do is just deliver a gene into your cells. So when it delivers that gene into the cell, what does the gene do? Well, your cell looks at that gene like any other gene and makes a protein. And this protein happens to be one of the proteins made by the coronavirus. And so when your immune system sees it, the hope is that it makes lots of antibodies that can then go after the real coronavirus if you should get sick. Most of the proteins being made by any of these vaccines try to mimic the spike protein, right, on the surface of the coronavirus. Why is that? So the coronavirus has this sort of halo of proteins, uh, and these are called spike, as you say, and, and they use this protein to, to latch on to cells in our nose or in our airway and then invade the cell. So this seems to be the best target for our immune system. So people who, who get sick with the coronavirus and then get better, uh, the reason for that is that their immune system figures out basically how to go after that, uh, that spike protein. So the virus just can't get into cells in the first place. So this Oxford vaccine is in phase three trials. Tell me where it stands and when we might get results. So uh, this has been going in phase three trials for uh, a couple weeks now, a few weeks now, um, in several countries, such as Brazil. Uh, and, um, you know, it, it, we'll have to wait and see maybe, you know, in, in, a, in a couple months, maybe we might start hearing about results. It really depends on how many people are being exposed to the virus in these different countries. They're, they really don't have that much control over how long it takes before they start to see good results. So maybe September, maybe October, we'll start getting a first set of results? It's conceivable, and I say conceivable, that uh, AstraZeneca might be making emergency authorized supplies of the vaccine in October. That's conceivable. Wow. Uh, could, could be longer. Now, the other two vaccines that in the past week went into phase three trials are one by Moderna and the other, I think Pfizer is taking the lead on it, maybe with BioNTech. And they do something different. They take a piece of messenger RNA and inject it into your cells. Explain to me why that's different and why it might be better. So the idea there is that um, just to remind everybody of their, their high school biology, um, in order to turn a gene into a protein, uh, first you, your cell copies uh, your gene into a piece of what's called messenger RNA, and that then is used by your cells to make protein. So these researchers have at, at Moderna, uh, at, at Pfizer, uh, have been trying out just making a piece of messenger RNA and then getting that into your cells, and then your cells just, boom, make protein out of it. 
Um, and so there could be potentially some uh, advantages. Uh, for one thing, um, it's a lot easier to make a piece of messenger RNA or, or also a piece of DNA than it is to take some chimpanzee virus or some other more traditional kind of vaccine because you're just like dealing with a code. You know, as soon as uh, the, the genome of the coronavirus was put online, um, you could just say like, okay, well, there's the gene for the spike protein. Let's just copy out the gene or, or a messenger RNA version of it and let's get to work. So that's why Moderna was the first vaccine to go into human testing. It's fast. And when do you think they'll be getting results? Well, Moderna and Pfizer, as you mentioned, just started their phase three trials. So um, that could be maybe a couple months. Again, it, it, there's a lot of logistics that go into determining when this happens. You've got to get 30,000 people or so into a trial. Um, you, they'll be doing these in many states in the United States. They'll be doing them in other countries as well. And you, you have to wait and see just how intense the epidemic is. If, you're, if you've got people vaccinated in a place where there isn't a lot of the virus circulating, it's gonna take a long time to see if you've got an effect. So you actually wanna to go to the places that are most intense, and there you're gonna see a difference quickly between people who are vaccinated with a real vaccine and who got the placebo. I'm in Louisiana and we're pretty intense right now, and I signed up for this uh, trial. Uh, was I foolish to do so? Oh, no, no. I mean, you, we, it's crucial that, that lots of people volunteer for these, these trials. Otherwise, we won't know what works and we can't move forward. So, uh, and <clears throat> we can only, you know, predict so far, like, where this vaccine is going to flare up and where it's going to cool down. I mean, that's, that's one of the really amazing things about this pandemic is it just, it explodes, it dies out, it explodes again. So, you know, I'm, I'm talking to you from Connecticut. We had a, a horrific problem here in April and May. Now we're, you know, one of the quietest places in the country uh, for now. Uh, we'll see what happens in the fall. So we talked about the viral vector, the more traditional vaccine, talked about messenger RNA, and you can also do it with DNA. It's about the same. Uh, which of them can be manufactured faster and easier and more cheaply if they come out ahead in this race? Well, there's actually uh, you know a, th a third group of vaccines that you know really have the big advantage of just a long track record in terms of experience. That is, vaccines that are made out of either a weakened version of the virus you want to vaccinate against, or just a killed one. Uh, and really, that's sort actually of like the old polio, Salk, and Sabin vaccines. Tried and true. Yeah. And, and even today, that's what most vaccines are. There, there is no licensed messenger RNA vaccine out there for people, none. Um, these, uh, we mentioned the adenovirus vaccines, uh, like the one that AstraZeneca and University of Oxford have. Um, that is just starting to get approved. Um, there was one that was approved for Ebola, for example, just like a couple of weeks ago. Um, they've been in research for years and years and years, but, you know, the vaccine world moves slowly. So, um, you know, if you want to think about, well, what would, what would be the kind of vaccine that you could just make in huge amounts? Well, you know, actually inactivated vaccines, virus vaccines, uh, or weakened ones, those might be the way to go. So who's doing those? Well, uh, places like China. So China actually has two inactivated virus vaccines in phase three trials right now. And so, you know, it, this is really an international story. This is not just the United States doing all the work for everyone. There's stuff going on in China. There's research going on in Singapore, Taiwan, Thailand, just India. Uh, and a lot of them are looking at these more traditional ones. The downside there is that it takes longer to scale up. You know, you want, it, it takes longer to make a big batch of, these inactivated virus vaccines, because you have to be very careful about it. You can't rush through it because you want to make sure they're really inactivated. The United States, uh, I keep reading, uh, has thrown a billion dollars here, uh, 1.2 billion there, to help vaccine development, like with Moderna or uh, even many of the others have gotten uh, federal grants. 
What do those federal grants do? Do they get paid back? And does that mean we'll get the virus more cheaply? Um, so, so this has been a, actually kind of a broad trend recently because um, vaccines have suffered a lot from what uh, vaccine makers call the valley of death. You know, some scientists do some work on, on animals. They, they see that a vaccine has some promise. And then they're like, okay, well, now we need some heavy hitters to come in and help us do the clinical trials and do all the, you know, paperwork for licensing and so on. It's incredibly expensive. And the manufacturing. And a lot of pharmaceutical companies look at it and are like, well, I don't know. Do we think it's going to work? Or are we going to just lose a billion dollars on this? That slows things down. Um, and so governments and philanthropic organizations for years now have been saying, Hi, we need to find ways to speed up this process for the good of everyone. So one idea is for governments to say in advance, okay, look, we don't know yet if this vaccine is going to work, but if it does, we're going to buy a bunch of them from you. And, you know, we will give you some money so that you're not taking as big a risk on this. Uh, and so that you're not going to get destroyed trying to make a vaccine that will help us all. And if it doesn't work, uh, do we get money back? Nope. Okay. <laughs> Uh, now tell but, me, you know, the, the, the whole thing doesn't work. I mean, if, if they say like, okay, like you're going to spend all, you're going to put, invest all, all this and take all this risk. And if it doesn't work out, you give us all this money back, you know, that that's not going to work for a lot of businesses. A lot of the pharmaceutical executives were testifying in front of Congress. Some of them said that they would provide the vaccine at cost, but others like Moderna said, no, we're not going to provide it at cost. And Moderna in particular has been pretty uh, secretive about its approach and has gotten some pushback from scientists. Is there anything that worries you in their approach? Well, I think in general, we need to uh, be a lot clearer on how everybody is going to get this vaccine. I mean, if, if, uh, if we, each of us has to pay $100 to get a vaccine, um, we're not going to get the kind of coverage that we need. Uh, and if Moderna says, no, we're not going to do this uh, at, at cost and won't even tell us what they're going to uh, charge for it, we have a problem. And, and we do especially have a problem given that, uh, that the United States government has been uh, supporting their work. Are you worried that there is no process and uh, plan for distributing them, for pricing it, for deciding who gets it? I, I certainly have talked to a lot of vaccine experts uh, who have been, been in this business for years who are concerned that we're not reckoning with the full scale of, of, this, the, of this challenge. I mean, there's a lot of great stuff, again, I should emphasize in terms of research. The trials are moving forward uh, without sacrificing safety. That's really important. Like we're, the, we're going to know about the safety profiles of these vaccines and in lots of populations. But you still have that question of how are we going to do something we've never done before? Uh, and we need, we need a plan now. And honestly, if you look at, uh, say, where we are with testing, you know, where, where we're running out of pipette tips, the most basic equipment for testing, that should make us all very concerned about whether we have our act together enough in the United States to do something far more ambitious than widespread testing. The getting vaccines to people as quickly as possible is going to be a much bigger challenge. And if we can't even get the testing right, which we're not, then how are we going to get these vaccines right? What happens if some people say, I don't want the vaccine? Well, I mean, uh, there's no plans to make it compulsory. Um, you know, the, some people have been wondering if companies will say, uh, in order to work here, you have to get vaccinated. Um, but, you know, that, that, is a, that is an important issue because, you know, in order for vaccine these vaccines to really be effective on a society-wide scale we need a lot of people to get them because you know the it's likely that these vaccines are not going to be a hundred percent effective so just because you get the vaccine doesn't necessarily mean you won't get sick but if a 80 percent 90 percent of people get the vaccine then it's just going to the vaccine the virus itself is just going to become a lot rarer because it's going to have a much harder time getting around and that's good for everyone
At-home tests are being developed by various places, mammoth biosciences, Sherlock biosciences. They seem like they'd be transformative. They'd bring biology into our kitchens and they'd let us know instantly how we are. Where do we stand with that and when can we expect at-home tests? That's a great question. I mean, I wish it would be like today. I wish, you know, I could hold up an at-home test right here on this camera. I, I, I'm, I, it is very frustrating that we, we don't have things yet um, because the, the, the tests that we're relying on now use a, a technology, PCR, which is a great, reliable, powerful technology, but it's old. It's, you know, from the 80s, and, and, uh, and, and it requires a lot of ingredients and a lot of careful fine-tuning and such so that, um, you know, you can't, can't e easily run a PCR in your house and on some little device. But as you mentioned, uh, these companies, they're using these, these new technology, which uh, you, you know very well, CRISPR, where basically you're um, using special molecular probes that can zero in on viral genes uh, in a maybe even just in a spit sample. Uh, and you know the preliminary studies on them are, are promising. Uh, and 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 that you know that sort of thing, uh, a, a cheap, easy you know think of it as like a home pregnancy kit, but for COVID. That would, be, that would change things so much. You just wake up in the morning, take a test, be like, oh my gosh, I got COVID. I'm not going to work. I'm calling in, I'm calling my doctor. We would be so much more on top of this pandemic. Tell us where your scenario is for how over the next year this movie might end. I think now when I think ahead to a year from now, I think that um, we will um, have uh, be much better treatments for people. So people who do get sick are, n are going to be less likely to die and less likely to suffer lifelong illness. People will be beginning to get vaccinated, so that will help to drive down rates. But, you know, I think we are still going to be making um, dealing with the virus just a part of our everyday life a year from now. I won't be shaking hands. I won't be hugging strangers. I just uh, you know, I just, it just is just something that uh, we're going to have to be ready to ride through. Um, my big hope, my big, big hope is that we take this experience and um, get ready for the next pandemic now. Um, that if, if, if we're not looking forward, we're going to get caught again. Carl Zimmer, thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank you.